it's a fish that one can come to love, but then the bottom line is you just can't trust them. <laughs> you know, they're gonna change. There's gonna change. They're gonna show you something different every time. Like that, they make clicks, and those clicks travel a long way underwater and it lets the other sturgeon know that this is the area where everybody is and you need to be over here with the rest of us clicking away. You got a sturgeon. Not that small. It's a baby. A baby. That first, say, six months of the life is almost a complete black hole. They get up to seven or eight feet long and up to about 200 pounds. They're one of the most docile fishes in creation. Anything this size is most certainly a female. It takes them uh, quite a few years, decades, to get to be this big. Someone pointed this out to me once. Um, the scoots on the underbelly look like hearts. <laughs> I guess they do. OK, flip. This animal is like a computer already, you know, and he's just been around. 150 million years ago, the first sturgeon swam into existence along the shores of Pangaea. This is back when dinosaurs ruled the planet before flowering plants and birds even existed. Like sharks, another ancient fish, the sturgeon settled on a body design built to last, featuring bony scoots, a multi-sensory snout, and an asymmetrical shark-like tail. Today, 25 species of sturgeon swim Earth's rivers, lakes, and seas. This is the story of the Gulf sturgeon and the biologists who are deciphering their ancient code. See you later, buddy. Ms. Oldland? Well, it has been 48 years since I settled on the mouth of Swanee River right on the main Northwest path. And I was supposed to tell you a story of the sturgeon. When we went in there, the fishing was industrial. And the fall we mullet fish. In the spring, my husband sturgeon fish. Sturgeon fish is a great big fish. It weighs at least from two to three hundred pounds. Those fish was caught in big nets, 16 inch stretch mass. They were tied by the tail and tied to stakes to keep them alive until shipping day. Then they were butchered and carried to Cedar Keys where they were iced up and shipped to New York. Well, in those sturgeon is what we call caviar, which is rose and the, and the other fish. Commercial fishing for Gulf sturgeon began here in the Suwannee River of Florida back in 1896. The fishery quickly spread throughout the sturgeon's range. European immigrants in the U.S. created a new market for sturgeon meat and their eggs, called caviar. Historically, they collected along the Gulf Coast, this side, over 400,000 pounds of sturgeon. And that's, that's quite, a, quite, a, quite a number of fish. After that, they just went down. There were no regulations on fishing, hunting, or logging back then. Targeting egg-bearing females for caviar was not sustainable. After surviving millions of years, 
One decade of over-harvest from 1900 to 1910 brought catastrophic declines to the Gulf sturgeon. Local markets with less intense fishing continued for decades, like the Odalins. In 1910, Eric and Luella married, and they moved to their new island home on the mouth of the Suwannee River to raise their family. Eric stopped sturgeon fishing in 1926. He became a fishing guide until his death. My grandfather was a dreamer. He dreamed of better things for his family. He dreamed of better things for him. My name is Bessie Christina Barber. I am a granddaughter of Alec and Luella Odlin. I'm Catherine, and I was a daughter of Oscar Odlin. He was the only son of Luella and Eric Odlin. He and my grandmother were buried on the island with two of their daughters that died. It's a monument to them and what they've accomplished. We can come and think about them and the many things that they've done. Over the decades, our culture of harvesting sturgeon for food began transforming into a culture of conservation. Alan Huff, Archie Carr, and Stephen Carr conducted the first scientific research on the sturgeon in the 1970s and 80s, often with help from the last generation of commercial fishermen. They discovered a scarce population in their mark and recapture studies. So, in 1984, with the population in peril, Florida banned all fishing for Gulf sturgeon. Seven years later, the sturgeon was listed as a federally threatened species under the Endangered Species Act. The era of sturgeon harvest was over. The era of research to understand and protect the species began. We wanted to learn early as to where the sturgeon were. We put out wanted posters from Louisiana to the Suwannee River just to get information as a start. A commercial fisherman provided us with nets, showed us some methods, and we went out and fished in areas that he suggested we go in and collected sturgeon. Whoop, whoop. Got one. Hello. Yeah. Got one there. I got him by the tail. And we were basically tagging adults just to try to determine uh, movement in the systems. Wow. Today, we use internal pit tags to mark individuals, including juveniles. A quick scan reveals any recaptures. It is a recap. It's an old pit tag. We've been putting new pit tags in those old. It's a it's a non 3D. Yeah. Three. Oh wow. That's the old the old recap. So, so this the tag that's in this fish it goes back at least 20 years probably. And as we collected them, we started to take tissue for genetics. We did satellite tags with the fish early on to determine, well, when the fish left the river systems, where did they go? This combination of tracking technology, genetics, and mark recapture work began revealing the incredible journey of the Gulf sturgeon. Later, buddy. There you go. Good job. Adult sturgeon migrate between the Gulf of Mexico and the river where they were born. They spend late spring, summer, and early fall in the river, then overwinter in the estuaries and Gulf of Mexico. 
Ike Worgen determined that there were several different groups of genetics across the Gulf. If they are mature and ready, they spawn upriver during spring. The conventional wisdom is they're just like salmon and they home to the same river that they recognize chemically. We don't know if that's how they recognize the river. Now, we use surgically implanted acoustic tags to track sturgeon between the river, estuary, and gulf. Ah, so this is one of our acoustic receivers. Handiest little piece of gear ever created by mankind. It uh, sits along the river here, and it picks up tags from our acoustic tag fish. And all it does is it just has a clock inside and it just logs them in as they come along. It says, you know, Bob was here on July 10th, that's 2 p.m. What we started to find out is that the sturgeon, when they came in the river systems, they were occupying certain areas that were very discreet. And we call those summer resting areas. You know, you had a river system that was say the Apalachicola, which is over 100 miles long, but yet you only had maybe a half a dozen different small locations where the sturgeon would hang out. Why are they in these particular areas? And you found out, well, okay, maybe it was the depth of the water or uh, the flow, the current, or there was a spring nearby. So there are several hundred Gulf sturgeon in a deep hole that's right off the mouth of this spring. The currents are quiet, so they can save a considerable amount of energy by just hovering at depth in these holding areas. So they're just hanging out. The adults, subadults, they don't eat in the river during the summer. When they go out in the fall, October, November, I tell you, they really put the feed bag on. I mean, they come back most of the time to the same system they left. Fat, they've gained weight. It's a different fish. They feed by suction feeding. They're like vacuum cleaners. They suck in the sediment, somehow manage to swallow whatever is in there, little worms and little shrimps and things. This fish has no teeth, you know, so this may look like a river monster, but you check out its mouth. I mean, it's, it's just like a tube-like, sucker-like mouth with no teeth in here. They're a benthic bottom feeder, so they've got this snout coming out, this rostrum coming out, they've got these barbels hanging down, and this thing is loaded with all sorts of sensors. And then the mouth is on the bottom, and it shoots out and downwards and sucks back in to inhale food, and then it spits out the sediment through the gills. It takes three years of feeding out in the Gulf of Mexico for them to build up a batch of several hundred thousand eggs that each female will spawn eventually. Oh, look at that. Feed from the chow and down. Look at that little rotund belly, fat bullet boy. So that's a very beautiful fish. Nicely fed, nice round belly. Breathing like crazy, he's doing good. You would never know in the springtime that there are maybe 500 sturgeon up here on these spawning grounds. The spawning takes place in the spring when the water is high and fast, and they're coming up the river. The males come up early, and they wait for the females to come about a month later. What they're looking for is an area with fast flowing water, and they want gravel, and then the eggs stick there. In the 1990s, biologists found the first spawning grounds, thanks to tracking technology and floor buffing pads. We put out pads to collect the eggs just to verify, well, this is where they did spawn. And we collected the eggs. In fact, we took the eggs 
back to our office where we uh, hatched them just to be sure that they were sturgeon. Jim Woodruff Dam was closed up in the late 50s, and that prevented the sturgeon from utilizing a lot of the spawning habitat in the Flint River. We found that they spawn up near the dam. They spawn where there's good hard rock, cobble, limestone. And we've been calling this area Indian Ledge because when we came here to investigate the spawning of sturgeon, we kept finding artifacts, uh, hide scrapers and knives made out of chert. It turns out that sturgeon spawn in the spring and the fall. It's not the same fish. And that's really a sort of a safety valve for the population. So if things are bad in the spring, they've got the potential to make up for that by spawning in the fall. To date, we found spawning locations in six of the seven rivers. The Pearl River remains a mystery. A few years ago, I was fishing one morning, coming up the river, and and uh, they were jumping everywhere. I mean, so I slowed down, you know, and just on the plane, just probably seven, eight miles an hour, had a big wide John boat, and the minute one jumped in my boat right here below the river, and trust me, uh, that was kind of scary. Ah, yes, the old question of why do sturgeon jump? I heard they jump to get their own barnacles and stuff off of parasites. Ah, uh, no, 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 no self-respecting parasite's gonna come off of the jump. Come on now. <laughs> the sturgeon came out and jumped right over the bow of the boat right down the other side. <laughs> it's the only time that's ever happened. Well, we found out that in order for them to hover near the bottom without spending any energy, they need to be the same density as the water. And so they adjust that by the amount of air that's inflated in that swim bladder. About every two days or so, that swim bladder has shrunk and needs to be reinflated. And while they're jumping, they swallow air and then they dive back down. And in the process of diving back down, they compress that and reestablish their buoyancy. In summertime, the adults aren't feeding in the river. So they go offshore, they feed in the wintertime. In the summertime, they're trying to save energy. And the best way to save energy is to stay in one place as much as you can. So they do the jump, get their buoyancy balanced, and then they can spend a lot more time without having to work. Makes sense. I appreciate it. I never talked to anybody that had any knowledge of how they do anything. The only time public sees a gulf sturgeon is when they jump. There's been several that jumped in and injured people, but they got these boats are so fast now and then all, and they, they don't just people just don't think about things like that, you know, anymore. When boating over summer resting areas, a high-speed collision with a 200-pound fish can be damaging, even deadly. They don't jump to attack people. It's, you know, jumping is a natural behavior. They're not evil, they're not trying to hurt people. <laughs> people are in the river and the sturgeon are in the river and so coincidences happen. It's unfortunate that there are some uh, you know, incidences when these things jump and people um, come in contact with them, but otherwise, you know, they're not trying to harm you and they're, they're just very, um, very calm. 
A sturgeon, when they're underwater, talk to each other to make a series of clicks. So three clicks in a row, then a jump, and another click is the characteristic sound of a jumping sturgeon. And so the jump has been incorporated into a, a pattern of communication. By the end of the summer, the jump becomes more of a hop. So we're going to spend a day and a half on the river and cover about 100 kilometers of the river. We're imaging the bottom of the channel. All of these shadows on the left-hand side are sturgeon, right below where the spring run plume is entering the river. They're big. I mean, they're all over a meter. This is the most major holding area on the Suwannee River, between 500 and 1,000 fish. So we're doing this technique in um, all of the Florida rivers now, then use models to estimate the abundance of fish in the reach that we scanned. In a day and a half, we could, we could scan and count 4,000 sturgeon. You certainly couldn't catch 4,000 sturgeon in a day on the water. The largest population today is on the Suwannee River with about 15,000 fish. The Choctahatchee supports the second largest population. Access to spawning habitat in both rivers is not blocked by any upstream dams. Recovery appears slower in the Apalachicola, Escambia, Pascagoula, and Pearl Rivers because of human alterations like dams, river dredging, shipping channels, shrimp trawlers, and pollution from industrial plants. The western area of the Sturgeon's Range also receives more frequent hurricanes. We have an enormous amount of water coming down the rivers. The dissolved oxygen goes down real low, and sturgeon need a lot of oxygen. So there's these natural mortality events that occur periodically, that, which no one can prevent. Currently, there are research teams working in all seven rivers from spring to fall. Most projects today explore what the juveniles are up to. We're catching them after they've come back up from the estuary as young a year or two, year three, four at this point. Probably a one-year-old fish spawned last year. Melissa has got some parasites. We know for the first several months of their life, they are eating only in the river. The question of how many cows can you raise in a field? So how many juveniles can recruit out of a given river each year? So we've actually caught all of these fish before. Uh, these are all recaptures. And so when they're real small like this, they have extra spiky scoots, which probably helps them uh, from being predated upon. We've gone through and tagged this guy and Gotten genetics from him and it's ready to go. I'm sure we'll see him again. If given the chance, a gulf sturgeon can live to be well over 40. Once we create an ecological portrait of the gulf sturgeon in each river, including the juveniles, we can begin restoration projects to enhance recovery of the species. The gulf sturgeon almost disappeared, like the dinosaurs. So once they were left alone, they had a chance to reproduce. And it takes the males about eight to 10 years to get mature, and the females about 15 to 20 years. 50 years ago, the last commercial fishermen passed their knowledge on finding and catching sturgeon to pioneering biologists. These biologists, from Florida to Louisiana, pass their growing knowledge to the next generation of researchers. I've always enjoyed this group of young biologists that are up and coming. I mean, just to watch them work and 
you know that the fish is going to be uh, taken care of. They're going to learn some stuff. Whatever you've learned throughout your time, you want to pass that on to someone. Science, technology, and dedicated biologists revealed the Gulf sturgeon is an ancient wanderer. The abilities of the Gulf sturgeon to use open habitats in big rivers, estuaries, and the Gulf feed on vast numbers of minute prey and exist off stored energy for many months. 55 uh, kilograms are the secrets of their success over millions of years. The technology and world around them changes, but this gentle giant remains immutable. Oh, oh, that, now you're really getting it. <laughs> She's like, I want back to the deep. 